If there is one thing in Africa that is modern, it is the presence of the mass media. As on no other continent, in Africa, the proliferation of radio, press, and television is a novelty, and the revolutionary world of the internet even more so. The power of satellites is slowly winning out over the tom-tom. Then while I was in, in prison, I was in central prison, and I developed the liking of uh, photojournalism and writing. When I came out from jail, I started by selling newspapers. Then he was lucky in his birthday, he was presented with a camera. That camera, then I started using it. My first picture to be used was used at post after the world newspaper was banned. And then during the time while I was freelancing, I was arrested, jail again, in and out. Mbuzeni Zulu became active in fighting the apartheid regime when his brother was arrested, tortured and jailed by the South African police in 1963. Shortly afterwards, he too was put in prison and tortured to the point of losing a hip. After that, when I was out, then I started again because I couldn't get a job. All I had to survive was through only photography. And then in 1983, the Soviet hired me full time. The Sowetan is the newspaper with the highest circulation in South Africa. It prints 450,000 copies for an average of 2 million readers a day. It was founded in 1981 at the most critical moment in the anti-apartheid struggle. Sowetan was then consolidated very clearly as a newspaper that spoke uh, for the people. It became the soul of the people, it became the undisputed voice of the people. At that time, in the 1980s, the black community was under tremendous air pressure from the apartheid regime, and there was a feeling of hopelessness with black people beginning to feel that uh, there was no future uh, for them and, and also no future for the country. Sowetan uh, itself has been the voice of black people from the time that it was started. Mostly is that uh, people were killed by the security forces. I would call the, 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 the regime that time was very brutal to African people. My camera always captured weeping, oppressed, suffering people. You know, you could see poverty in their faces. People were in chains. People were crying. People were oppressed. Things were very difficult back then because I remember um, I had to do a story, I was on a magazine, then I had to do a story about uh, people who were on death row and because it was so difficult and you know you did certain stories, you wanted to do them because you had the passion but um, you just knew the risk, you know, you were scared. It's very boring now uh, being a journalist. 
Before 1994, it was a major adventure to be a journalist. You faced danger at every turn. Uh, mostly uh, you had to cover uh, stories that had to do with unrest and it was almost impossible for the activists on the street to differentiate uh, journalists from other people. And it made life very exciting. The emotion with which the Sowetan's editor-in-chief speaks is the result of the constant human rights violations to which South African blacks were subjected. Today, his paper's journalists can fortunately devote their time to covering events such as the annual Miss Soweto contest. All of these young women were born during the most difficult years of the anti-apartheid struggle. They spent their childhood in a country dominated by a white minority that denied blacks their fundamental rights. This apparently frivolous event is a symbol of the new era. Today, these young women, like many other men and women in South Africa, have reasons to be confident about the future. These young women in particular dream of being models and striding down the runways of Paris and New York someday. In fact, some of the most sought after models on the international scene are black and South African. With the end of the anti-apartheid struggle, the Sowetan has not ceased to work on behalf of the black community. Its reporters still go out onto the streets to report on the problems affecting them. One of the most important problems in South Africa is that of street children. Miriam Majibuku heads a program which helps abandoned children in Soweto. So far, what has been the major challenge facing the, the, the home uh, so far since you took over? Well, challenges come in different forms. Number one, you do have a challenge of having to bring up children from a newborn baby mm. up to our eldest child being 21. We also have challenges lately because some of the children who are abandoned are infected by the HIV virus. We also have a big challenge of having to cope with grief for most of the time because those children don't live up to three years already. We have lost four of our children through death. <laughs> Lying here in the bottom is a woman who was necklaced by the people in Zimthorpe Township. This woman came to visit the boyfriend, but she had a problem, a tradition that she had some marks, and then she was mistaken, mistaken and then she was killed and necklaced. In this picture here, former state president Nelson Mandela, they were celebrating 37 years. So Mandela is the first soldier of the liberation movement. These people all here are scavenging for food. They are unemployed. They don't have houses. So they eat from the rubbish dumping ground. All these people, including these children. Some of these parents here are these are their children. So throughout, they spend their lifetime in this dumping ground, taking anything which is being thrown by these trucks here. This time, it was the first time the police in South Africa were confronted by the oppressed masses workers who started beating police, assaulting them with all sorts of weapons. They didn't have guns, but they were using just welding traditional weapons, sticks, but that time, this was during the time of the state of emergency. We're still 
or press were not free by the time. During the anti-apartheid struggle, Soweto became a true focus of resistance. Little by little, this poor township is trying to move forward. Well, Soweto is relatively calm compared to before 1984. I think today we see even whites can go there, they have some drinks, socialize with people, um, you know, you can visit the area if you have got some attractive tourist destination. Soweto is a suburb of Johannesburg, a heartless modern city displaying all the contrasts of the new South Africa. During the apartheid years, blacks could only walk the streets of the capital center on their way to and from work. They were not allowed to live or travel through here at certain times of the day. Things have changed, but many social problems are far from being resolved. All those prominent leaders which are leading this country today through this newspaper, the Sovietan, the World and the Post. After 1994, um, it has been better in a sense that um, there is a lot of transparency. Um, and fortunately for us, most of the people who are in government are the people that we knew as you know, um, fugitives, according to the old government. delivered a miracle, but that miracle was only the beginning. It was the foundation. The real miracle was what was going to be built on that foundation by the behavior, the actions of people in the country from 1994. And that is why for journalists it is that much more important to look at how the democracy is being understood and what are the things that are being done by journalists to make sure that they remain the watchdog of the democracy, the watchdog of the people. still surviving. I like the newspapers, I like my photography, and also the contribution I did, and also I don't regret also to have these limbs in my legs, because whatever happened in the past, it was for the good cause, because now South Africa is free. Until not long ago, in Africa, news was transmitted by word of mouth. No tradition was more firmly rooted than the oral tradition. For this reason, in some places, the television is still called the talking picture.
The first radios and televisions came into Africa during the years of colonialism. Africans in turn used the media in their struggle for independence. Today, radio and television are a vehicle for development and the creators of the Western dream. Two out of every three young Africans dream of heading off to the affluent Europe they have seen on television. Eighty percent of Africa's population still lives in rural areas. In villages and hamlets, it is unusual to see a television. But anyone who has a television in one of these places becomes the most popular person for miles around. Every afternoon, just as they used to do with the guriots and storytellers, these villages people come together for the ritual of watching the television. Welcome once again to another week's edition of Ladies' Time, broadcast for you, for all of you, from Kekesei Kagadi. Just like every Wednesday, we'll be giving you all the tips you like so well. Today we'll be talking about how to get a husband as a widow or divorcee. Don't turn off your receiver because we're about to begin here on KKC Kagadi, the radio that invites you to be free every day of the week. Amita Nabawanuke directs and presents Ladies' Time, a program for women on KKC, the community radio of Kagadi, a small village in northeast Uganda. Every Wednesday afternoon, Amita plays music, offers advice, and organizes discussions aimed at a primarily female audience. She touches on home and work problems for rural women, sexuality, AIDS, and family education. KKC has a broadcast radius of 100 kilometers and is funded by a Ugandan NGO whose work encompasses all areas. Income generating activities which include the farm, which include the metalwork and mechanics, the, uh, the carpentry section, uh, the solar training center, and the community radio. not a commercial radio. Hmm? Like people from the community, they could just come straight forward in the studio if they want to pass the announcements. You come, you pay some little money, you sit on the microphone, you inform your people. Like, I'm informing you, so I'm informing so and so, I've not been able to come home. So don't get worried like that. So that's how we operate. And that's how we are different from other radios. It's important for you to know one thing. Don't be ashamed of being a widow or divorced. Men need us. 
Without us, they can't have children. They can't have a family. We don't have to be submissive or confrontational. We should be the ones who demand respect. We do 90% of the work in the fields and the home, and we're proud of it. Be hard workers and carry yourselves with dignity. As Amita says, women perform the majority of the physical labor in rural Uganda. But they do not only offer manpower. In Kagadi, with the support of the URDT, they have created cooperatives to set up new businesses. One of these creations is fish farms. <laughs> We began organizing in 1989. We set up a group of agricultural businesses to raise vegetables, carrots, tomatoes, cabbage, cassava, sugarcane. Then came the fish farm. Asumin manages a fund which distributes 80,000 euros a year in the form of microcredits to 500 local women. I've achieved my dream. We worked tenaciously, and we've managed to stabilize our income. The investment is beginning to bear fruit. The result is that I've been able to send my ten children to school. All of this guarantees the future of my children and those of the other women in the community. You all have a friend, a sister or a cousin who's afraid of not getting a husband because she's a widow or divorced. Maybe it's you in this position. The way you do this is to be attractive to them. Let them see how you manage your cooperative, that you generate your own income, that your children are clean and you yourselves are neat and tidy. If you do this, no man will be able to resist you. The role of the radio is mainly social mobilization. We use the radio as a tool for social mobilization into community action. And the radio has helped us and is continuing to help us in disseminating information, in other words, broadcasting messages, which reach a larger number of people, messages in agriculture, messages in human rights, messages in leadership. We talk on different topics every time we come with different topics, like we can talk about hygiene in homes, and even then we could talk about discipline in schools. Hmm? If a teacher comes and writes on the blackboard and yet he finds himself in as not she does not brush his teeth. So instead of the kid or the pupil listening to what he's trying to tell him, it will just because of his smelling, it will just put off the pupil <laughs> instead of getting what he's teaching. Hmm? I think when I say that uh, Information management, you understand what I mean? In addition to the radio program, Amita gives computer classes to the children of the village of Kagadi. She is originally from Kampala, the nation's capital. So I'm going to show you this. Me, I'm a computer analyst and I, I like computing very much. And as a hobby, at least I come and play music. But what I think to do in the future, what I like in my life, hmm? is to become someone who is, uh, since I, I'm dealing with the computers, I'd like to be with a very strong machine, which is the computer. You surf internet, you go to music centers, you record you, everything on the computer. And for example, our radio here is not working on the computer, but I would like also to be connected onto the computer.
Francis Oyo follows Amita faithfully. He has spent the last 40 years working in Murchison Falls National Park, where he offers guided wildlife safaris to tourists not far from the village of Kagadi. I came here as a big boy, and I was trained by someone who was uh, my pilot. He's very old now, also at home. Uh, in 1970, that's the time when I got the lances for driving this boat. And later on, I was wounded also in the park during that time, in 1975. I have a very strong team for lions. They really didn't keep the lions together. We went for patrol. We confronted with some uh, poachers who are having guns. So that's the time when I was hurt. Uh, during the war, when the war arrived in 1979, during the meantime, when they were chasing me off, we all ran away from here. Animals were suffering very much, mostly elephants, buffaloes, hippos. The elephants were being killed for their eyeballs, they were killed for their meat. I'm used to the animals and the life with me, I'm also. I like the, the life, animal life, to say the, the nature. I like the nature very much. That's why I've spent a lot of years here. Another day has come to an end in the highlands, in the jungles, and along the rivers of our lovely country. Wherever you are, KKC and your friend Amita have been with you on the radio that walks beside you. This is the end of the program, but remember what I say every week. Don't forget to be free. It's your only obligation. Africa is the continent with the least access to the internet on the entire planet. Despite this, the results of the virtual revolution are visible every day in Africa as well. For the first time, thousands of African students have the opportunity to access global information quickly and at a reasonable cost. Never before has the rest of the planet had so much information about Africa available in real time. If we punch the word Africa into a search engine, we will get more than 50 million hits. At the top of this list, we find Africa Online, the most complete site for general information about Africa and the largest internet service provider on the continent. Once at the home page, we have access to information from every African country on a wide variety of subjects. Education, NGOs, art, health, women. If we click on women, we can find out, for example, how a group of female activists were arrested in Sudan, or the reasons for which the King of Swaziland has banned the wearing of miniskirts. Africa Online was the idea of a group of Kenyans living in the United States. In 1994, they returned to their country of origin to develop the site and set up a network of public internet access centers, the first cyber cafes in Africa. From any of these, it is possible to send an email for 10 euro cents, the cost of an envelope and pencil. Allemagne, six États contestent la loi sur l'immigration. Six États régionaux allemands gouvernés par des conservateurs ont déposé hier une plainte devant la Cour constitutionnelle contre une loi controversée sur l'immigration. En 1983, donc, la télévision a été... Television came to Mali for the first time in 1983. 
Since then, it has come some way, in spite of all the problems we have had to overcome. Mohamed Lamine Touré is a cameraman, editor, and producer at Malian Television. For some months, Lamine Touré has been working on a documentary about the situation of street children in Bamako. If I called you at such short notice this morning, it's because I wasn't able to get everything together for this documentary until the last minute. For some time now, I've been considering the idea of making a documentary about the street kids of Bamako. We mustn't be oblivious and ignore the situation. We have to do something. Somebody has to come out and say something. The situation of this country's children is unacceptable. I've chosen this work, an audiovisual technician. I want to go as far as I can in this sector. I want to show the world what this country is like. I want to show what Mali's like, what Africa's like. Show other people that there are other interesting things about us. It's enough if you just have the will and devote a little time to listening to and looking at the images that come out of Africa. Not images seen through other eyes, but images made in Africa by Africans. But for this, we need resources. And meanwhile, they leave us here vegetating with cameras that nobody uses anymore and lights that date from the birth of the cinema. It should be easy to understand that like this, we can't compete. Garibu means beggar in our language, in Bambara. It doesn't matter what corner of Bamako or all of Mali you look in, you'll find them there. Most of the time they're kids that should be in school or with their parents. We see these children begging together with older people. Where do they sleep? Nowhere in particular. In front of shops or markets, in the mosques. They are tempted in all sorts of ways, above all the girls when they reach a certain age. Every time a traffic signal turns red, you see the garibus. They run up and sing, give to God, give an offering and open the path to forgiveness in the great beyond. I've thought about doing a documentary about the Garibus and their current position in our society. Perhaps people would become more aware and try to do something to change it. Mohamed Lamine Touré studied journalism in Mali and then continued his studies in London. He has worked in Japan and France, as well as with some of the best directors in African cinema. Lamine Touré could be working in Europe, but he has chosen to remain in his country. His wish is for Mali to create a competitive audiovisual industry. The second subject that I wanted to treat 
The second issue I've wanted to study involves the flani. Flani means twins in our language. In traditional Malian society, it was lucky to have twins. It meant that the house would see happiness. We believed, and still believe, that giving to the Flani brings good luck. But I'm surprised by the growth of twins in our city. What really hurts is above all when one realizes the blatant exploitation these children are subjected to. Some even dress children who are not twins alike. It's enough for them to have the same clothes and to look a little alike. They fool you and you give them alms. We also see women who, although they don't have twins themselves, will even go to the extreme of renting them from another family to make use of their services. To give money to twins, you have to cross your arms, like this, just as our ancestors did. Albino twins have always made a real impression on me. From the time they were very young, five or six, every time you stopped in front of the Air Afrique headquarters building, there they were from morning till night. I told myself then that someday I would go and see them so that they could tell me a little about themselves. Yefeke means albinos. And the most famous Yefeke in all Bamako are the Air Afrique albinos. I've had a great time asking them, what will you do the day one of you gets married? One woman for the two of you? Being a child, poor, and a twin is synonymous with being a street beggar. The parents usually rent them out to the highest bidder. Another case of tradition-based child beggars are the Garibu, children whose parents cannot support them and send them to a Quranic school. As the Marabut cannot support them either, he sends them out onto the streets with a begging bowl. These children, when they are too old to be able to beg on behalf of the Marabut, become boot blacks, window cleaners, loaders in the market, or simply vagabonds.
comprends bien, les conditions de vie sont difficiles pour tout le monde. I understand that life is difficult for everyone, that's true. This is what makes begging a way of life that requires no effort today. You only need to have a physical handicap, know how to sing or know how to get to people, and if you're lucky, you can earn a living. We're in a hard line of work, the audiovisual media. Nowadays, people are against us. Many come quite close to attacking you when they see you with a camera and a tripod filming a report in the city. This is an everyday experience for audiovisual technicians and workers. However much we explain to them that this concerns all of us, they don't understand. They come up and say, no, don't agree to this. These people are going to exploit your image. They're going to manipulate your image and show you naked. They're going to make pornography with you, things like that. بينكم وبين تونس همزة وصل موجة تحس إنك معي موجة تحس إنك African tradition speaks of a continent marked by oral culture and also by the visual, by the culture of gesture and movement. With this background, television could not but triumph in Africa. However, the high cost of technology and program production make it the prerogative of the few. There is an enormous difference between urban centers and rural areas in terms of access to information. 90% of television sets are located in the cities. While in North America or Europe, there is almost one set per inhabitant. In Africa, there is not even one for every 40 people. There's another subject I've thought of doing, the blind people who are led by child guides. Sometimes these are not their own children. Here children are exploited as well. They are rented out to guide the blind at intersections, traffic lights, in shops, anywhere where there's a crowd. Often, the blind abuse these children. Life is not just about eating and drinking. Life is also about culture. Life is living and knowing what's going on in other places. So I dream of a Mali where the children want to be filmmakers. I dream of a country where we never stop looking at our own images. Yes.